that live in a region, an area that really embraces diversity. And uh, I think that there's never been a more important time in, in our country to uh, respect the person next to you, uh, regardless of race, creed, color, sexual preference, uh, sexual identity. Um, I'm really encouraged by um, my, uh, my kids' experience here in California growing up, um, just in terms of acceptance. It seems like our, uh, the young generation is, is learning more and more about we all just are who we are, and we're all individuals, and uh, what makes our country great is our, our diversity and um, the fact that we uh, can respect each other and, and uh, work together and embrace each other. And uh, I think it's, um, it's an important night for us, and we want to welcome everybody from the LGBTQ uh, community. And uh, maybe if you're coming to the game tonight and your child says, what does that mean? Explain it to them. Explain to them the importance of um, loving the person next to you, respecting them no matter who they are, where they come from. They're human beings. Um, we're all human beings. We're all in this together. And with that, we'll talk basketball. Uh, That's it, right? Yeah. Drop the mic. <laughs> I mean, think about it. <laughs> um, the not so serious topics. Uh, yeah. Hypothetical for you tonight. Let's say plays really hot. <laughs> You know, maybe like a Pacers game last year, and you know, kind of was on the line. Would you, would you keep them in tonight to raise more money? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I hadn't thought of it. That's a good question. Um, I think I just have to do my job, and uh, I'll add some money to the pot instead. How's that? <laughs> I go. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? My hair looks great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we have the same. <laughs> barber, <it's everyone. laughs> should fun. be my barber, your hairdresser, right? That's Thank you. Proper term. Yeah. Um, so on those lines, Clay, a thousand dollars a point. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah. For yeah. the next three games. Just your thoughts on that? For the, uh, for I think it's program. awesome. I think it uh, shows Clay's commitment to community, his awareness. I think all of our guys do such a good job of really being uh, aware of uh, helping. Um, other people around them, and it's a great gesture. And um, I notice that other people are chipping in as well. It's taken on a life of its own. I think that's wonderful. And, uh, uh, a lot of us in the organization have made uh, donations through the Warriors Foundation uh, to the Napa and Sonoma uh, relief efforts, and uh, I'm really proud of Clint. A little diversion here, and then uh, you've been playing Durant. With that second fourth mm -hmm. quarter unit, was that the plan going in? Did that kind of something that you you kind of changed on the fly? Did you start the season thinking um, maybe unlike last season you were going to play Durant to, to start the second and fourth quarters? And then why would you be doing that? Well, if you remember last year, we actually did start that way yeah. at the beginning of the season. We changed around mid season. Um, we sort of fell into that other rotation that we really loved, um, and then in the playoffs we started creeping back towards getting KD on the floor when Steph was off. So um, I wanted to start out this year and try to get KD comfortable uh, with the second unit at the top of the second quarter. It makes perfect sense um, to have either one on the floor at all times. I mean, it just makes sense on paper. It didn't look that great last year. Um, it wasn't, you know, we were more effective when uh, we went to Draymond with the second unit. It was a, uh, just a better defensive lineup, and we, we made some really good strides but then you get to the playoffs and you're facing better offenses and, and so I, I really want to try to establish um, the two of them being separated at times being able to lead their respective groups definitely Steph and KD um, and um, whether it works or not we'll see but um, it's a long season and this is how I want to begin the season to see see how that, that looks Steve, uh, Michael Grange here from Toronto. How are you? Good, how are you, Michael? Oh, good, thanks. Um, you know, as you probably know, the Raptors have really increased the volume of their three-point shooting, and, and you know, a lot of times the uh, credit goes to the traditions you guys have started here. But how does that play in your hands or not play in your hands when, when a team comes in and tries to get up 30, 35, 40 threes in a game? It depends if they go in or not. Um, you know, I, I think every team has to forge their own identity. I mean, Houston wants to take 50 of them. That's who they are. Um, you know, I, every team has to play to their strengths. Uh, but there, there's definitely been a, a movement by a lot of teams uh, 
to play faster and to shoot more threes. I think it's just the trend um, that has been leading uh, us all in this direction. Um, and we didn't start it, by the way. We've, we've just been following the trends. But um, my guess is, and, you know, this is as an observer, uh, that Toronto has uh, learned from the playoffs the last few years. Um, they've played Cleveland and out there lighting it up from three. That's tough to beat. Um, and they, they just wanted to make a, a subtle shift more in that direction. And again, that's just an observation more than anything else. But um, you get whatever you do, you have to commit to it and be good at it. And it um, seems like Toronto was playing well here early on, and, and it's working for them. Steve, what did you think of Quinn Cook's stand with you guys, and what do you want to see Damian Jones get out of his time in Santa Cruz? I love Quinn Cook. Uh, he was here for about four days, and I could tell the guy is um, just a phenomenal teammate, rock-solid player, uh, good shooter. And so um, we're using the two-way uh, situation with him. We're going to try to um, limit his days. You know how the rule works. It's a four, 45 days, I think. So we want to limit his days so that we can use him for games specifically when either somebody is uh, injured or resting, uh, somebody in the backcourt where we need that body. And uh, so we'll bring him um, up and back during the year. And, and uh, I talked to Coach K about him, texted about him. Coach K loves him. He's just kind of our type of guy, competitor, tough, um, smart, understands um, a role on a basketball team that's, that's important. As for DJ, we're excited to uh, to let him play down there. He needs to play. And um, I talked to him the other day on the road. Um, this is probably an unfair metaphor, but I reminded him that Aaron Rodgers didn't play for like three years. <laughs> so you go ahead with your, you know, I just compared DJ to Aaron Rodgers jokes. Um, but more than anything, it was just a reminder that, um, especially for a young guy like that, should be a senior in college, uh, I think. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but you know what I mean. He's just a, he's just a kid filled with potential. He needs to play. Uh, he's playing on the best team in the league, the world champs. He's playing behind th three or four veteran centers who have been doing this for a long time. There's just no minutes for him. So we got to send him down to Santa Cruz, get him minutes, develop him, and we think he's got a bright future. And, um, you know, you, you just keep – Pounding away if you're a guy like that. You work, you work, you work, and eventually your time comes and you can take advantage of it. Steve, um, guys are committing almost 25 fouls per game in the early goings. I know it's a small sample size, but has that been something that's concerned you, and what, what do you think the correction to that might be? Our entire film session this morning was, was about fouls. It's uh, We have a number of issues that we're concerned about, but that's number one. That's by far at the top of the list because the domino effect from fouling is dramatic. You're giving up three points game is stopping, um, you're getting in foul trouble so that you're getting into the bonus earlier. So that means when you do have to commit a foul, maybe to stop a fast break, it's two free throws, the pace of the game changes. And more than anything, it's just a sign of discipline. When you keep reaching and keep reaching uh, mindlessly, you're obviously not going to execute very well at the other end because your head's not in it. And, uh, so that's our focus right now. And, um, and we think that if we can take care of that, uh, that'll solve a lot of our problems and that'll allow us to continue to, to grow. Because um, Al Harrington had a documentary to, that released today on uh, medical marijuana. And in that documentary, David Stern advocated for the use of that in the NBA. You've been a proponent of, of, of that. Have you tried that, talking about that on Monty's podcast? Do you think that one day, the NBA or leagues will have, will allow for the use of medical marijuana or marijuana. I, I do think it'll happen eventually. Um, I think the uh, the world is starting to understand that opioids are way worse for you than anything. Um, and right now in professional sports, we're just quick to write a prescription for oxycodone or Percocet or something when your shoulder hurts or your, you know, your knee hurts or whatever hurts. Um, I think the it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky issue. Part of it is perception. So I think what we're learning these days um, is that uh, medical marijuana is much healthier than those, uh, those alternatives. But the perception of the fans is important uh, in terms of uh, selling our business. Um, but the health of the players should be by far the most important thing. So it becomes about how do you do it, how do you regulate it, 
um, you've got to differentiate between medicinal marijuana and recreational marijuana. I don't think it makes sense for you know, everybody to use recreational marijuana. I do think it makes sense to use it for specific injuries, and uh, I don't know how that happens, how it manifests itself, but the league, the league would be wise to look into it, and I think every sports league would. Because uh, I assume if we got on YouTube, we'd see you know, clips of you uh, banking the ball off the backboard and slamming it with both hands. Probably pretty frequently on, on on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, you probably see it. Probably, probably. So where do we stand with Jordan Bell? It's become kind of a national debate. Was this too much? Was it not enough? Was it? Did you warn him? Did you tell him? Was the unwritten basketball rules? I told him after it happened. I said, "Be ready for them to retaliate." And um, he had a bit bewildered look on his face. Uh, I think the issue is um, we've got old school uh, people, players on our own team. You know, Sean Livingston, David West, like. Young guys are like, man, that was cool. Uh, you know, I'm I'm sort of in the middle. I I, I never want to embarrass uh, our opponent. Um, we've been on the other end of it. It's no fun. Um, I kind of like what Draymond says. Um, you know, you want to make it in this league, you take it. You don't worry about what anybody thinks. And if that means you throw the ball off the backboard and you dunk it because you're establishing yourself, go for it. I kind of like that. Um, but I'm very um, reluctant to encourage it because I know, you know, how, how Rick felt the other night, how their team felt. They're struggling. They're on their own floor. Um, so we don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, but I do think uh, we, like every sport, uh, we kind of have some, um, you know, unwritten rules and codes that um, they, I don't know how much sense they really make. Like the one that kills me is at the end of the game, if you're up 20 and there's 29 seconds on the shot clock, you're supposed to take a turnover. I tell our guys, shoot, shoot the ball. You know, the game says you're supposed to shoot it. Um, last year we took a three in a situation like that. Washington was angry. And, um, I've seen teams down 20, um, excuse me, up 20 at the end of a game where a guy on the other team came down and the team that was up 20 got mad at the guy for shooting. <laughs> it's like, so I, I think we sometimes we we cloud like what's really offensive and what's not. Um, offensive to me is putting somebody in harm's way. It's um, hurting somebody. Um, you know, I think you know the respect issue is is one that's seen differently by the younger generation. I don't think Jordan felt like he was doing anything wrong. I cringed because I knew how Rick was looking at it, and then Draymond told uh, told Jordan. You, do, you be you, and Draymond has forged an, a, a, an all-star phenomenal career out of basically saying, screw social norms, I'm gonna come out here, I'm gonna kick ass. Yeah. And I like that, I respect that, I want Jordan to, to do the same. Um, but he could still just duck it next time. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. Yes, yeah, Steve, the, the Nick Young, uh, Patrick McCaw situation, they're literally no way for them both to get minutes, or is it just you want one to get substantial minutes as opposed to getting both in and getting both minimum minutes? Kind of thing? Well, we're talking about if everybody's healthy, um, and we already played 10 guys, uh, so if you want to play another one, that's 11. Most teams play nine. Um, and you're talking about playing a guy in a wing position where you know, Clay's going to get 33, 34 minutes. Andre and Sean are going to get the minutes. So I don't see a possible way of playing both of them unless we have a blowout, which is ideal. And then they can both get out there like the other night. Uh, so the reality is only one of them is going to play in the meat of the game. And uh, neither guy has really uh, established that role yet. And you know how I am. I, I, like, I like everybody to get a chance um, throughout the year. Everybody's going to play. And, um, but if somebody seizes that role, takes it, then I'm going to get on that role. And that hasn't happened yet. Great. Thank you.